Hi, I'm Tim Harrison. I'm the Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. Uh, we're an Australian listed company. We're developing a magnet and heavy rare earth supply chain from our Makutu rare earth project in Uganda. Tim, good to see you. How good are you? Good to see you, Matt. Well, here we are in sunny South Africa. Thanks yes. for being in the sun, because I hear it's usually a bit more grey than this. Um, so you're here at uh, One to One, and you're going to schlep over to Ndaba as well, see if, see if you folks on the servicing side. Um, what are you here to try to do? Because you've raised your money. You don't need to be talking to anyone, do you? Well, we're still, you know, we've got lots of investors. Lots of people are very keen in the story. Mm. Um, it's really about connecting uh, with those investors, being able now to move forward with a lot of activity in Africa and set ourselves up now for the next 18 months to march Makutu towards production. Right. Okay. Let's talk about the money you raised, I think, because it's important because it allows us to understand what you're going to be doing going forward. Say $30 million, not too shabby. Who, who uh, came up with that? Um, so that raise was done um, between Canaccord in Australia and Spot, uh, Spot in, um, in Canada. Right. Um, global institutions, it was really well supported. So we've had uh, yeah, institutions and some EV funds come on board. And uh, yeah, it's really given us a lot of tailwind now to go ahead and get cracking on everything we want to do. So how does that change the register now? Because obviously moving towards that away from retail into the institutional side of things, that, that's better for you in, in what sense? Oh, I think, again, it's a vote of confidence in everything we're doing. They can see the opportunity um, for a substantial appreciation mm. in the value of Ionic as we move forward with this supply chain. Right. And, and it's important because these EVs, we're going to require new supplies of, of magnet rare earths. Yeah. Um, we're perfectly placed to be a, a real participant in that. Absolutely, and, and you've always talked about the kind of scale of it, and we'll, we'll talk again about the, the, the recent announcements with regards to uh, how much more you've got. Um, but you've got to talk about, you can't have any conversation in mining at the moment without talking about Russia and the impact on, on you guys. So obviously it's probably been quite good for you in, in, in that sense. Yeah, look, I think um, supply chains being what they are and the, the brittle, fragile nature of supply chains what we're doing is, is something completely different. We're providing a new source of magnet and heavy rare earths in the markets in the US and Europe that, that don't have access to that material or will have increasingly more yeah. challenges getting that blend of rare earths by the end of this decade. Right. And you know, again, from previous conversations, I remind people, where are you looking to? Are you looking towards Europe because they're kind of comfortable with an African story? Or because of again recent events and critical mineral you know sec mineral security, North America very much part of that conversation still. Very much so. I, we've seen tremendous interest out of North America. Um, we still have very good discussions with Europe, and it's. Yeah. I mean, Makuta is a very large asset. Um, yeah. The potential to to supply both markets is a real one. Mm. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we have a, an asset at Makuta that's scalable. We can ramp up production. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of flexibility and optionality with the way in which we develop Makutu and, and go downstream. Right. And, and again, I'm just sticking with the macro for a little bit longer, which is um, US starting to put the squeeze on China. China traditionally, the, the rarest sort of epicenter of, of the world, certainly in terms of technical and, and, and processing. Um, is that affecting your optionality? It was, was China still in the, the running for, um, you know, Offtake. Yeah, look, it's 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 a fluid uh, environment. Yeah. I mean, um, we're aiming to have Makutu in production in 2024. Yeah. When we look at the global landscape as it stands today on heavy rare earth refining capability, it's dominated by China. Mm. So um, if we're looking at other markets, then the requirement for us to also have that value add mm. in going downstream, in refining, separating our mixed rare earth carbon yeah. and being able to market the product in North America and Europe really does depend upon providing an option on okay. downstream processing that doesn't exist today. Okay, so I guess in terms of revenue streams, you, you, it's fluid, like you say, it's fluid. Let's, let's leave it there. Cause it, it, I think there's a lot of discussions that are happening around ways in which this can 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 be developed right. potential to stockpile product okay um so there's all sorts of different scenarios that that, that can be looked at mm. um but ultimately it's about the product and and where we want to be so you know begin with the end in mind yeah we want to put the product yeah and, and work backwards but but in terms of the the value okay you know the ndpr the the the, the that side of things that 
yes, lots of demand for it, but in terms of the value for you, that's not where it's at. It's, it's in the heavies, right? It's both, right? But, but, but as a proportion, I mean, is it 50-50? Um, NDPR is about 50% of the potential revenue of the project. Right, okay. Maybe rare earths, uh, another 50%. But when we look at the magnet rare earths, the NDPR, the DYTV, yeah. it's about 90% of our revenue. It's okay. 90% of the basket. And this is why we're certainly seeing a lot of traction now with EV manufacturers looking at getting access to the full blend of rare earth, magnet rare earth elements they need to make the magnets to go right. to the motors. So the, so the battery manufacturers, right, so you, they, they, they are from where? Like South Korea? Uh, so magnets, so yeah. magnet manufacturers, um, you, you, ultimately, you've got the, the EV manufacturers who are now committing billions and billions of dollars yeah. on infrastructure to move their EV fleet or they move their product suites away from internal combustion gotcha. engines to EVs. Gotcha. It's been a huge amount of work done in batteries, mm. but the motors and the magnets has really been uh, overlooked, and now the pennies dropped. Right, right. So let, let's talk about how you advance the project. For, <coughs> for pardon me. Um, you've got thirty million bucks in the, in the kitty raised recently. Why, why that amount, and what are you going to do with it? That um, amount of money enables us to work through finalising the feasibility study at Makutu and ultimately getting this ready for FID. Right. Okay. Potential to to do a demonstration plant. Right. Which would provide feed material for refinery piloting and downstream. Um, validation work, right, um, and also provides us with money to be able to progress the magnet recycling initiative with Seren uh, Technologies uh, in the UK. Which you, you had approve, approval for that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, just back on that, so it takes you through to um, F F I F I D, which is great. And at that point, you're going to need to raise s some capital. So what will you've needed to prove up? Or because I imagine you're in discussions already, and I expect that this week's a lot, a lot about that. What would you need to prove to to the market to the uh, financiers? Well, I think it's around. It's it's around ultimately it's the supply chain. Where's the right. product going? Yeah. And how, do, how does the project <coughs> generate revenue? Um, so it's about building that supply chain, bringing the partners right. who will be working with us on the supply chain. Yeah. And um, and I think on the back of that, we'll be in a very strong position to pull the trigger on the So we break that down for me, because that's really interesting, because you've always said it's a very kind of complicated industry. It's very, very, yes, it's very, very technical. There's not a lot of players and, you know, they're looking for diversity of supply, et cetera. Um, so precisely what do you need to have in place? Off-take off agreements, contracts in place at agreed amounts uh, before the financiers will say, well, okay, there's, there's your money? I, I think we're probably looking more at partnerships. Okay. Um, partnerships on supply chains. For part of your uh, potential product uh, output, you're not going to get 100% all in with one group. No, oh, it depends. It depends on who is ready to move quickly and, and who's ready to secure their EV production capability. Right. You know, based upon the numbers that we're looking at for the for the refinery producing around four thousand tons of rare earth oxides per annum, right? That would be that would pr produce enough magnet rare earth elements to enable about two million EVs per annum. Right. So okay. it's okay. a significant. Um, Where does that put you in the world? Um, well, would be a fraction of what's going to be required. Right. So, so right. So, still the deficits. You're, oh, you're saying big time. Right. I mean, by the end of this decade, I think the numbers are forecasting around about 30 million EVs produced annually. Right. Okay. Right. So the recycling bit suddenly becomes very, very interesting, doesn't it? Well, it's exactly. It's a, it's a piece of the pie that, that I, I think adds greatly to this life cycle ownership right. of, of rare earths that we're looking at, uh, at building yeah. in the integrated supply chain. Because when you, when you take the rare earth elements, the oxides, you process them to, to, to metals, powders, and magnets. Yeah. Not all of it ends up in a finished product. There's there's offcuts. There's waste. That material can go back into a recycling initiative mm. to basically enable us to be very very efficient. Yeah. With the conversion of the product from Makutu into ultimately the the final magnets that go into the motors. So it doesn't make sense that, that stays within the company. Was at some point like that the recycling company gets spun uh, out. Look, I think we're we're looking at all sorts of different scenarios. I think the recycling. Technology enables us to have more than one recycling plant. Yeah. It's modular, it's low capital. We can deploy them across the US and Europe. L under license? 
Um, partnerships. Partnerships is that's still preferred method. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And does that affect? Because obviously, um, you know, a lot of mining companies like to move downstream. It, it helps them with their kind of re rates and, and perception uh, of, of value because different multiples, right? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Do you, how do you see the recycling bit growing? Because given the size of the the asset that you've got, it's it's a significant project for a long time as well. Um, where does recycling fit in, in, in the mix in terms of your attention to it, in terms of the growth potential of the company? I Not think, just margins. Yeah, no, I think um, magnet recycling will be something that grows substantially over the, the rest it's of the It's going to need to. Well, if we look at what's currently being produced out of China, somewhere between 20 and 25% of the magnet rare earths that are produced in China are sourced from recycled materials from around the world. Is that right? As much as that? Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay. So it is an appreciable amount yeah. that at the moment is all finding its way back into China. And we want to try and provide a, an option for you know, governments and, yeah. and partners globally to make sure that we can do that within their own jurisdiction. Well, it kind of works for China because the, the efficiencies are there. If they're the kind of any, any um, story in town and they're getting all that feed, brilliant. And you know they don't probably have to pay too much for it because there's not a lot of competition. When there's more companies like yourself doing this recycling, the, 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 the price of that feed increases, the competition increases, and the, the kind of scalability is, is a little bit tougher, right? Um, I think it's all about supply chain being able to source the magnets. Right. And again, working in partnerships with the companies that are currently sourcing that material mm. um, and working with ultimately the end users on life cycle ownership of products as well. So, mm. you know, if you look at, say, for example, wind farms, you know, these are large magnets that, you know, have a life. Wind farms get decommissioned, the, the, the wind turbines get decommissioned, and that material needs to be reprocessed mm. to, to be turned back into new turbines and new new generators and magnets for for, for for new new wind turbines. Yeah. So there is an opportunity with working with wind farm operators, right. um, wind farm OEMs yeah. on life cycle ownership of the rare earths within the magnets. Yeah. That's just one example. Yeah. Um, in automotive, obviously there's a lot more uh, the magnets are smaller, there's a lot more material handling required to, to, to extract the magnets. But it is something that's going to grow dramatically over the rest of this decade. It's going to grow. Do you think that re retail, sorry, I know you're moving slightly away from retail and versus new focus on the institutional. Institutions are now getting it in a way that perhaps they haven't or haven't wanted to kind of step in. Um, so the conversation is, I guess, a little bit easier for, for you. Are you getting them, are they pushing you a little bit and say, well, what more can you do in terms of their single country risk, the single asset risk? So um, just stepping back to the institutions, I think we've come across a number of institutions who've reached out to us based upon the recycling. Right, okay. Because they're understanding the supply chain risk, certainly in jurisdictions like Europe, yeah. where this material is currently available in stockpiles. They know that it's going to increase in time. Yeah. And it provides a, um, you know, a ESG um, appeal with yeah. regards to recycling the material back into new products. Simply, we can't just keep producing more magnets without being able to source yeah. material from, from these yeah. you know, spent yeah. magnets and waste products. Right. Okay. Given the lessons of this 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 year, maybe last month, when did the PA come out? Uh, that was April 29, April, 2021. 2021. There we go. Ago. Okay. So you, lessons learned there in terms of messaging out to market, right? And um, you perhaps <laughs> unfairly judged, judged on that because people can, didn't actually read what you wrote. But it, going forward, you're going to need to be really clear in signaling. You're going to need production 2024. You're going to be really clear with people about signaling what you're going to deliver by when between now and, and then. So do that for me now. What are the big moments that they need to look at? Uh, as far as you're concerned. So by the end of well, by the end of October this year, we'll have our feasibility study completed and we'll have a mining license application. Right. Under the Ugandan Mining Act, the deliberation period on that mining license is 60 days. Yeah. So if we're able to get okay. the application in earlier, we may have a mining license by the end of this year. Okay. Um, but you know, realistically, it's probably going to be early next year. Okay. Then we'll be working through FID and and trying to get this thing into production by 2024. And let's, let's just focus on Africa for a bit. That's why we're all here. We're in Africa. We're talking Africa. The, the ability to do business, and not just Uganda, but, but, but Africa more broadly as far as you're concerned, is 
It's slightly more difficult, the same as, harder than, where, 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 where do you put it, than, than other jurisdictions? Um, I think with regards to our experience with Makutu in Uganda, yeah. it's been a very positive one. Right. I mean, we took our initial 20% interest in this project in August of 2019. So in that period, yeah. we've drilled out a, a massive resource. We've completed a scoping study, yeah. you know, in a bit over three years from that time, we'll yeah. have a feasibility study completed and a mining license application. That's so we've had really good engagement within Uganda. Yeah. We've submitted our ESIA. We're expecting to get formal feedback on that in Uganda in the next couple of months. Yeah. Um, we're working through a resettlement action plan now. Yeah. We've had really good engagement from the different departments within yeah. the Ugandan government. There is a motivation to get Makutu into production because there's tremendous support within Uganda. And, and I think it'll be a great uh, advertisement of yeah. the ability to work in Uganda in going from explorer to developer and ideally an operator within sort of five years of being, that, that's uh, taking an interest in the project. Double quick time. Absolutely. Is that because you don't have to worry about any of that kind of ESG rubbish? Oh, no, that's not the case. <laughs> um, ESG is front and centre of everything we do. Right. Right. I mean, don't talk about that. I, mean, I do that in jest because we had a bunch of CEOs come on here and say, oh, because you kind of got the, the people talking about, oh, ESG, what a waste of time and money. It's just a joke. Over here again, it's an essential part of, you know, um, mining's um, determination to improve its, its image and take responsibility, right? So lots of people sitting on either side of the argument there. And CEOs come on here and say, look, we've always really done it. You know, if you, you can call it what you want, but we've always done it. It's been part of what we do. It's the only way you can get anything done in country. So for, for your, your experience is, is what in, in Uganda? They're not here just because you're not getting an easy run because they just want your money. You've still got to do things the right way. That's right. It's part of your social license to operate, right? Yeah. You have to be a good corporate citizen. You have to be doing, you know, good good work in country, and you have to be doing it in an environment environmentally sustainable manner. Yeah, they are just the basics. Yeah, you know, we are aiming to produce a a, a rare earth blend that's going to help move the world towards a fraction of the carbon uh, net carbon zero. Um, yeah targets yeah um there's no point doing that if we're not doing it in a sustainable manner in uganda and we've got a long life asset you know the potential to really extract full value by doing it right mm. from the outset is very important tim good see you mate likewise mate well done on the project thank you, you. you're moving it forward at a pace at a lick and it's good to see a lot of inbound uh, coming your way you deserve it thanks mate